Hi, my name is Travis McVeigh. I'm an anesthesiologist from Dallas, Texas. I host a podcast called Thank You Notes at Ars Longa Media. Showing gratitude to people just makes me feel good, and I want to share the practice of thank you notes with everybody who listens. I write thank you notes to people and then bring them on the show to read it to them. Past guests have included my high school teachers, my friends, other physicians, and a couple of internet celebrities. I will also be doing episodes that explore the science behind gratitude practices to demonstrate to everybody the actual tangible benefits of practicing gratitude. Listen everywhere you get podcasts and check out the extras on my social media accounts. Thank you for listening. You're listening to an archived episode of our 2017 Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. Inside the board's All Audio QBank is the only board's preparation resource that allows you to study on the go and doesn't cost you any extra time during your Step 1 dedicated prep time. Go to the link in the show notes or insidetheboards.com to learn more. Podcast listeners can get a discount on a subscription to our All Audio QBank. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout for 25% off. The Step 1 version of the QBank is powered by questions from Osmosis and Lecturio, which have been optimized for audio listening and learning. Thanks to all who support us by purchasing a subscription to the All Audio QBank. It helps us continue to produce this podcast for free for you. Thanks for listening. I want to live outside, live outside of all of this. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. Today, as part of our Study Smarter series for Step 1, we're going to use questions related to musculoskeletal diseases. Emily, thanks so much for your time. Let's uh, get right into it. First question, a six-month-old infant is seen in the emergency department because of new bruises. Multiple fractures are confirmed and the parents appear very distraught because they do not recall any specific trauma causing these injuries. Which of the following findings would be most consistent with the parent's story? A. Bluish scleral discoloration. B. Ecchymoses over the buttocks and flexor surfaces. C, retinal hemorrhages, D, torsion fracture of the humerus, or E, vertebral fusion in the lumbar spine? And the answer is A, a bluish scleral discoloration. All right, so what are they talking about here, Emily? What's with a bluish discoloration to the sclera? Okay, so the bluish sclera is one of those classic buzzwords for osteogenesis imperfecta. This is basically a defect in the body's ability to create type 1 collagen, which if you remember the mnemonic one for bone, it makes up a large part of your bone. Patients with osteogenesis imperfecta are really prone to fractures, and that is basically what they're painting the picture of here. They don't know what happened, but the patients got fractures. Yeah. So the important things in like this short little stem, this little warm up question is the bruising, right? Multiple fractures and uh, the pediatric population, right? This is a six month old infant. Those kind of three elements should alert you to osteogenesis imperfecta as a possible cause. But I guess the other thing that uh, you need to keep in mind is the presentation for OI often overlaps with non-accidental trauma or child abuse. So, Which is kind of what most of the distractor or the wrong questions are here. So, or the wrong answers, excuse me. So the um, particular retinal hemorrhages, that is classic red flag for child abuse. And that was choice C. And then choice B, ecchymoses over the buttocks and flexor surfaces. Is there any reason as to the location of um, 
or is there any importance to the location of the bruises in ruling in non-accidental trauma? I guess what I'm saying is you'd probably expect some, you know, bruising, bruising over both. the, you know, the extensor surfaces of the uh, lower extremities for a kid. They're always bumping into stuff. But if in a stem you see ecchymoses over the, the buttocks or flexor surfaces, those are less likely to be accidental and uh, more likely to be intentional. That makes sense. Yeah. So, and then a torsion fracture of the humerus, which was choice D. Again, that's another, I guess, uh, non-accidental trauma finding. Um, so a torsion or spiral fracture are caused by twisting forces along the axis of a bone. So this one, this answer specifies the humerus, but another fracture that you might get tripped up with is a torsion fracture of the tibia or the femur. So in this particular question, the kid is only six months old, so they're not walking yet. So clearly any weight-bearing or long bone that has a spiral fracture in it, you want to be suspicious of non-accidental trauma. However, once you get to toddler age, say they're three years old and they're walking around, a spiral fracture of the tibia is maybe, maybe accidental. Once they're walking and can kind of twist their legs, it's not pathognomonic for non-accidental trauma. I think uh, sometimes some of the review books, especially probably ones that are a little bit older, will, you know, mention a spiral fracture as kind of pathognomonic of child abuse. But that's not quite true, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what you're saying. I think the literature does bear that out. As an orthopedics resident, are your suspicions raised for child abuse if you uh, were to see a kid in the ER with a spiral fracture? So this question actually paints a good picture that if you saw a spiral fracture, you would be very suspicious just because the kid is so young. Six months old infants are not walking. So if you saw a spiral fracture in a kid who's not walking, that should raise the hairs on the back of your neck. But we'll keep it simple at that. So last choice was E, vertebral fusion in the lumbar spine. What's that supposed to make us think about? I think they're trying to describe the bamboo spine that you would see with ankylosing spondylitis, but that would be much later in life. You would definitely wouldn't see it in a six-month-old baby. It's kind of an outlier here. So fast facts then, what we need to remember about osteogenesis imperfecta, like you said, type 1 collagen defect with a classic finding of multiple fractures in a pediatric population, blue sclera due to the translucent connective tissue in the choroidal veins of the eye, and then I guess some other high-yield facts or hearing loss is common in patients with this, as well as uh, dental abnormalities due to a lack of dentin. Next musculoskeletal question. 15-year-old male comes to his pediatrician's office because of pain in his right humerus for the past three months. He also reports a recent low-grade fever. Further examination reveals mid-shaft swelling over his right humerus. The patient denies any recent history of trauma. Genetic analysis shows an 1122 translocation, and an x-ray of his right arm is taken. Which of the following findings is most likely on imaging? A, an onion skin appearance. B, punched out lytic lesions. C, necrosis surrounded by sclerotic bone. A spiral fracture. Or E, a sunburst pattern. And the answer for this one is A, onion skin appearance. All right, what are they trying to tell us in this question? So basically, they're trying to cue you into what the diagnosis is. So they are painting the classic picture of Ewing's. This patient is the right age. He's 15. He's got a low-grade fever, and he's also got the classic translocation 1122. So after you kind of get to that point, you're thinking Ewing's what is the classic appearance of Ewing's on an x-ray? And this is pretty much rote memorization, but you have onion skin appearance on x-ray. So there's actually two of the answer choices which have to do with bone tumors. You've got the onion skinning as well as the sunburst pattern. So basically with onion skinning, 
as the tumor in the bone expands, it lifts the periosteum, irritates it enough so that it makes a thin layer of bone, grows again, irritates the periosteum enough so that you create another layer of thin bone. And on x-ray, that's what creates this kind of lamellar onion skin look onion skin appearance, that's kind of like a buzzword, right? And Mm -hmm. the boards have tended to go away from using buzzwords. Um, Still, there are classic kind of descriptions that that do show up. But if I were to do this in complete appropriate medical terminology, would you say a lamellar pattern of like, how, how would that be put perhaps in a radiology report? I guess the, just the lamellar look of the cortex, multiple layers of thin bone. Okay. I guess I was just highlighting the fact that lamellar is not a description that we use in OBGYN a lot, <laughs> but it kind of uh-huh. just rolled off your tongue. I actually, myself earlier, I was thinking like onion skin appearance. I don't really want to use that, but I couldn't think of how it would be described radiographically or without using you know, the, the the buzzword, but I I think you hit the nail on the head. All right. So Ewing sarcoma, I need to remember what young male adolescent yep. with translocation 1122, translocation 1122 and classic finding on x-ray is an onion skin appearance to any particular bone that this tends to grow in more than others? Ewing sarcoma is most typically found in the long bones. Basically, they happen in a lot of areas, so I wouldn't use that as something to direct your answer. I would more so go towards that classic translocation age range. So let's go through the distractors and maybe we can tease out some more information related to bone malignancies that's good to remember for the boards. Choice B, punched out light lesions. With that, they're trying to get you to think about multiple myeloma, the uh, plasma cell malignancy. This classically presents with uh, a few findings, but I guess what would you want to remember for test day with respect to multiple myeloma? So the age range is another big thing. You wouldn't okay. suspect multiple myeloma in an adolescent child. Um, and punched out lytic lesions is another classic. It really, when you look, when you see them on x-ray, they really do look like someone's taken a punch, like a hole punch and punched out the areas in the bone. And I think the biggest thing here is the age. So let's say you have a question that presents somebody older than 60 who um, has bone pain, right? What other features are are going to like show up when it comes to multiple myeloma in like a vignette, would you say? Multiple myeloma, first of all, wouldn't be in this age range, but say you had someone who was appropriate age range, a little bit uh, older in their 50s or 60s. In the question stem, they would clue you into some of the other things that they would have. Classically, they have proteinuria, renal problems, and they would have hypercalcemia in their blood. And then I guess the other thing to remember is with multiple myeloma is the monoclonal M spike on serum protein electrophoresis and the presence of Ig light chains in the urine, which are called Bentz-Jones proteins. I think those are other high yield points to remember for multiple myeloma as well. What about choice C, which was necrosis surrounded by sclerotic bone? So this, if you were actually looking at an x-ray, can sometimes look very similar. However, they're describing it for you, so that helps a lot. So necrosis surrounded by sclerosis of bone is cueing you into osteomyelitis. As the infected area dies, it necroses, and then it stimulates more bone growth around it. And so the story or the stem here probably, if this was the answer, would talk more about some nidus of infection, some way that it was introduced. The age range for hematology just spread is a little bit old, but they would present with signs of sepsis probably in the question. Okay. It does have a fever, um, and that's why it's not a horrible selection. But once they give you the translocation, you can effectively rule this out. Okay. All right, choice D was a spiral fracture, which we had just discussed with respect to osteogenesis imperfecta. So I think it's clear that that is not the answer. But E, which is perhaps the most attractive distractor for a student, is a sunburst pattern. So what's a sunburst pattern? 
So this also has to do with the way that your periosteum reacts to your bone growing rapidly or a mass growing rapidly. So if we go back to the idea of your periosteum being pushed out and then a layer of bone forming and then it being pushed out and another layer of bone forming. A sunburst pattern is where as it gets pushed out, the growth is so fast that you don't have enough time to lay down a whole layer of bone. So certain cells will grow a bone and then it gets pushed out. And so the growth is almost in the other term they use sometimes is uh, hair on end. It's almost so you grow little spikes of bone just because the periosteum is being lifted and stimulated so quickly that it grows almost straight out from the bone rather than in any sort of layer. Uh, this is where it's more for osteosarcoma, but in real practice, it could be either. What about Codman triangle? Codman's triangle is almost a radiographic it, it just happens in the way that we take radiographs. So it's not technically a triangle. I think it has to do with the spicule sticking out. And then if you catch it at the right angle, it looks like a triangle. If you have a question then where you're reading through it and you're like, you get to the end, right? Right before you uh, look at the answer choices, you know it's going to be a bone malignancy. Perhaps as we were reading this, you thought that, you know, you, the listener, thought that. What are some things, I guess, to really help you keep straight the difference between Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma? Is it only the radiographic findings on step one that you're going to be thinking about? or The translocations, I think. So translocation 1122 for Ewing sarcoma. And then for osteosarcoma... Is there a higher incidence of osteosarcoma and or predisposing factors that would clue you in to that diagnosis? I was thinking familial retinoblastoma. All right, let's move on to a 58-year-old man comes to the clinic because of a recently developed fever and pain in his right foot. He has a history of poorly controlled diabetes mellitus type 2. His most recent hemoglobin A1c is 9.4%. His temperature is 38.8 degrees Celsius, which is 101.8 Fahrenheit. Pulse is 88, respirations are 20, and blood pressure is 142 over 76. Physical examination shows his right foot has a 2 centimeter ulcer on the lateral aspect of the fifth metatarsal. This location is positive on probe to bone testing. A radiograph of the right lower extremity is unremarkable. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management of this patient? Is it A, IV fluids, B, insulin, C, vancomycin, D, observation, or E, clindamycin? And the answer is vancomycin. Why is the answer vancomycin, Emily? All right. So if you look at the question, you can kind of paint this picture. So this is a poorly controlled diabetic and he's got a diabetic foot ulcer. So looking at his exam, he's got a ulcer over the lateral aspect of his fifth metatarsal. And then they tell you that it is positive on probe to bone testing. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying that doesn't sound you good. stuck a Q-tip in it and you touched bone. So clinically, that already diagnoses osteomyelitis. Next, they tell you that the radiograph is unremarkable, and you might be thinking, he has osteomyelitis. Why isn't anything showing up? In the early stages of osteomyelitis, you might not have anything on x-ray. A little bit later, you'll probably see something Like there, what? But it's some lytic changes. Okay. This might be early, might not be there yet. And then they give you a set of vitals, and so basically they're trying to ask you, is he sick? He has a foot ulcer, but is he sick or is he not sick? He has a fever, but he's not tachycardic, and he's got a normal blood pressure. So he's not sick enough to need IV fluids right away. So we don't think he's septic. Yep, he's not septic. He's not well enough for you to just watch it, and he's not well enough for you to just send him home on oral clindamycin. So that gets rid of those options. Insulin, he definitely needs insulin at some point, but the question is asking you what is the most appropriate next step. And so IV vancomycin will treat the osteomyelitis. More specifically, it's IV vancomycin, and they didn't give you the option of just IV antibiotics. 
but vancomycin is kind of a go-to choice to treat the most common bug that causes osteomyelitis, which is staph aureus. Now, I will say this is something that probably shows up on everybody's step one exam. It's certainly going to show up in your study. What is the most common cause of osteomyelitis? And so the answer is staph aureus, right? Mm -hmm. But the other question is, what's the most common cause of osteomyelitis in patients with sickle cell disease? And that answer is... It's actually still staph aureus, but... The thing to remember is that if you have someone who has positive salmonella in their osteomyelitis culture, that will tell you that it's sickle cell disease. So I'm taking step one, and I see a vignette that just clearly presents osteomyelitis because of fever, <laughs> positive with a probe to bone sign, etc. And I get the question, what's the most likely etiologic agent? That answer is going to be staph aureus, regardless of whether or not that patient also has sickle cell. Correct. Okay. So that's different than, and that's the distinction that needs to be highlighted, than if you have a vignette with a patient who, I guess, has a... A bone biopsy. So say you had someone who had a bone biopsy and it grew out salmonella. They would have to ask the question kind of from that perspective. Then you could say, oh, this is pathognomonic for someone with sickle cell anemia. Or else you could say, um, the question could ask you about a patient who has sickle cell anemia and osteomyelitis. They could ask you what additional bug you would want to think about. But if they ask you what is the most common, it's still staph aureus. So even a patient who has osteomyelitis on a vignette and also has sickle cell anemia, even if the answer choice is A, staph aureus, B, salmonella, C, pseudomonas, you're still going to pick staph aureus. As the most common. Okay. Perhaps another way that this could be set up, though, is... If they present a vignette of somebody with osteomyelitis who also has sickle cell anemia is to list, say, five answer choices and leave staph aureus off the list. Um, they could put like, A, it's salmonella, B is pseudomonas, C is candida. But then the answer would be salmonella, mm -hmm. would you say? Because the prevalence is so high uh, amongst uh, patients with sickle cell disease. No one else really gets salmonella osteomyelitis. Cool. You kind of touched on the distractors, so I don't think we need to uh, specifically go through each of those. But really, this is a question that, uh, that highlights kind of what the boards are trying to get you to do because they present this case and they give you enough information within the vignette that you can diagnose osteomyelitis. And then you're hoping by the time you get to the interrogatory that they're going to ask you uh, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis, but instead they're taking it a step further and asking you which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management of this patient. Had the patient been septic or hypovolemic, essentially presenting with you know tachycardia, low blood pressure, then fluid resuscitation would have made sense. IV insulin would make more sense in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. And I don't think people are likely to pick that unless they really skimmed the vignette and only saw 58-year-old guy, diabetes type 2. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And they didn't notice the 2-centimeter ulcer on his, his foot that probes all the way down to the bone. Um, the vancomycin is there because it treats staph aureus. And not just staph aureus, it also treats MRSA, so... Yeah, and then oral clindamycin, is that something that you even do with osteomyelitis? Uh, no. Yeah. So if he just had a foot ulcer that was infected, mm -hmm. which he could, except that it probes down to bone, so clinically he has osteomyelitis. But yeah, basically, if you felt like it was just a foot ulcer that was not osteomyelitis, then... A course of oral antibiotics is reasonable. Okay, cool. Any other high-yield things to remember about osteomyelitis for step one? 
if they ask you what test that you were going to get next, uh, the answer would be an MRI. Okay. Why don't I an X-ray? So just like we had kind of mentioned before, the X-ray is negative for a while at first. Just because they have a negative X-ray doesn't mean they don't have osteomyelitis, though. So if they wanted another test, you would get an MRI because it shows up sooner there. So, all right. Next, a 19-year-old man comes to the emergency room because of difficulty breathing for the past six hours. He reports that earlier that day he was doing laundry and suddenly became short of breath. He also reports back pain for a year that is worse after waking up in the morning. He reports that his morning stiffness typically lasts for approximately one hour. Over the past few months, he has noticed pain in his hips intermittently, but did not have insurance, so he didn't go to the doctor. Chest and spine x-rays are obtained, indicating fusion of the lumbar vertebra. Which of the following laboratory studies is most likely positive? A, HLA B27, B, HLA DR3, ANA, cyclic citrullinated peptide, or E, rheumatoid factor? And the answer is, you would most likely be positive for HLA B27. Why is that the case? Yeah, if you go to the vignette, this is also classic ankylosing spondylitis. So you've got a young guy with back pain. But That's everybody worse has in the back morning, pain. Stiffness. <laughs> uh, and worse in the morning. So oftentimes people have back pain in the real world after a long day at work. But these patients classically will wake up with back pain and wake up really stiff. And it takes a while for them to kind of warm up and for the back pain to get better throughout the day. They also classically have SI pain. So it's kind of lower back lumbar pain. Uh, if the test question were to give you an x-ray of the chest and the spine, the classic x-ray for ankylosing spondylitis is the bamboo spine. And basically, it's that calcification all the way around the vertebral discs, making your spine look like a long piece of bamboo rather than having a vertebra and then some space and then some more vertebra. You'll see that the calcification just goes from one vertebra around the ring around the disc to the next one, connecting everything. Also, though, brings up a good point. You're probably not going to see a report on the the boards that says, and he's got bamboo spine on an x-ray of the vertebra, right? You're more likely to see it described as, say, vertebral fusion or to mm -hmm. actually see an image. And since we can't really show you an image on the podcast, just keep in mind vertebral fusion is really what we're getting or what they're getting at with referencing like a bamboo spine. So then from there, you kind of have to know the diagnosis already. Young guy, low back pain with this x-ray, which hopefully they would show you. Now you're thinking ankylosing spondylitis. So that is one of the seronegative arthropathies. So basically seronegative means that you are negative for rheumatoid factor. So you could cross that one off. And that was choice E. Then the seronegative arthropathies are positive for HLA B27. So that gets you to your answer. So the thing to remember with HLA B27 is ankylosing spondylitis, as well as what the arthritis is that are associated with psoriasis. Mm -hmm. So you've got psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, IBD, and reactive arthritis. Okay, cool. And then choice B was HLA DR3 positive, but that's that's probably more of like a memorization thing for autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes or SLE, not so much or not at all this. Choice C was a positive ANA. We'd expect that more with uh, lupus, right? And features of lupus that would be important to know in a vignette would be a female predilection, butterfly rash, symmetric arthritis, right? So D was a positive CCP or cyclic citrullinated peptide. And that's just pointing again to rheumatoid arthritis. So if a vignette was presented and it said this patient has some sort of arthritis and lab studies show a positive CCP, the most likely diagnosis is... Rheumatoid arthritis. 
arthritis. The rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Right. So like the rheumatoid factor and CCP are kind of ways to target rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, they kind of call it double positive or double zero positive if you're both CCP positive and rheumatoid factor positive. So then that makes choice E, which was positive rheumatoid factor that we already discussed. Uh, I guess we can just move on from that because CCP and rheumatoid factor should go together. Yeah. So if you look at the distractors here, they are one pointing you towards rheumatoid arthritis, and that would not classically be a young male with low back pain. That would be more an older female with a lot of hand pain. An ulnar deviation. I remember that. Of their fingers. Yes. So it has a lot to do with hands. Um, Obviously, it's not just your hands, but classically it has to do with your hands. Um, and then the other distractor is HLA DR3, which is a distractor because it sounds so much like HLA B27. Yeah. So that's it for musculoskeletal. Just wanted to thank Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track Live Outside off The Spark, their new album, about which Rao said, What I was trying to do with this album in marrying the personal and the political is to ensure that human vulnerability is laid bare and to not be afraid to speak about emotions. Plus, this album is a little lighter than what you heard previously with the song Anesthetist. At any rate, check out entershikari.com.